Okay, here I'm going to go over the basic uh, steps to process information in a scientific sense. So first part, um, there's kind of five major categories or steps to observe. You want to explain those observations, hypothesis testing, refine hypothesis, and repeat if necessary, and then communicate findings. While they are steps, I don't want you to think this reaches a significant or set end point. Uh, it does kind of represent more of a circle is a good way to think about it. We are necessarily maybe repeating the results if necessary. And if you get to the end, that may generate more questions that require more observations that require you to explain those, and around and around it goes. Now, observations do not assume when you're observing, just document what you may see. Uh, use your senses when possible. Typically in science labs, taste is not used. Uh, but you can look at what you see, what you may hear, what you may feel. And I say do not make assumptions because here we're looking at, if we're observing through these cameras, you may not see something that's very close. For example, this pigeon sitting there. Here, don't assume that this cat can simply attack this mouse. There could be a piece of glass between those two. Looking at explainer observations, while not may always, well, you mean, well, you may not be always able to get to an answer, it can help generate or start the thought process. So developing kind of a sequence of things, seeing how things may connect, trying to problem solve, explain what you may see, bringing maybe others in initially for ideas are all good ways to try to develop that initial explanation of your observations. Can this to hypothesis testing? Well, hypothesis testing is used of stats to determine the probability of a given hypothesis being true or not. If you perform it correctly, there's actually four uh, steps through this that can use statistical software. So step one, formulate the null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. Null indicates that there's no significant differences between trial groups, and it can also be thought of occurring by pure chance. How does this look like in an example? If I'm determining a fertilizer will make a plant grow better, the null hypothesis would say the fertilizer will not make the plant grow better. In contrast to that, the alternate Observations will show real effects, meaning the fertilizer will make the plants grow better. Uh, step two uh, is using a uh, statistical test to determine whether or not uh, the null hypothesis will hold true. And there's many different types here. If you take a stats course, you'll get into them in more detail. Uh, binomial tests, one sample t test, chi square test, one way ANOVAs, things like that. These are all uh, tests that are used to help determine the likely or unlikelihood of a result being true. Now, step three is generating a p-value, and it's a number between 0 and 1 that helps determine the significance of the results. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence against the null hypothesis. So what this means is that if we have um, a p-value of 0 0.05, that would mean 95% chance uh, that the results are against the null hypothesis. It means only a 5% chance of there being an error. That's why it's important to have a very small value. And while we may not be calculating this, it's important to understand this because we may be looking at um, data or other people's results, and they typically will include a p-value. So I want you to know what that means. Step four is when you have that p-value, you're comparing it to the acceptable significant value, sometimes called the alpha uh, value. If it's statistically significant, the null hypothesis is ruled out, and the alternate hypothesis is determined to be valid. So going back again to our example of fertilizer making plants grow better, if we fall in this range, fail to reject the null hypothesis, this would mean likely the fertilizer did not make any uh, significant difference. Here, if we're looking at, the, if we're above that critical value, looking at, well, maybe that fertilizer in this case did make a difference compared to our control group. Uh, so again, null hypothesis is this simply fertilizer will not make the plants grow better. And if we have enough data to support it, we may show results where that fertilizer did not change anything. But if we have that p-value indicating the results are probably not by chance, indicating, well, we have a big enough sample size and more grew better, that can cause us to reject that null hypothesis and therefore ex accept our alternate. Now, when we're finding that hypothesis, uh, if needed, consider other sources and uh, um, areas of investigation. So it's not too late to completely change your hypothesis. You know, when you're looking at something, uh, other doors might be opening. I uh, might want to refine that. You might want to look at um, potentially other options as you get more data. And you want to repeat the process if necessary. That's why it's important to kind of think of this as a circle, even if you do get to the end. Often the initial ideas do not pan out, so maybe necessary to go through the steps with new information and develop a more refined thought process there. And you want to communicate those findings. Uh, so it's important to communicate your findings to others. 
This can be officially in like a court setting or publications or informally at like a local level. Typically, both oral and written reports are required at the end. Written reports should follow standard scientific guidelines and should be included in introduction, background information, methods, results, discussions, and also recommendations. And these are great ways to kind of build that community, take other people's ideas, and continue to work with them.